Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to TED Excellence, the show in which we're always on the borderline of a Madonna song. I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I come to you live from my Corona Bunker on the moon with Dog Cat Fox, a Pepper Jack, and all of you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to Thursday. Uh, temperature rising Thursday. Yep, spring has sprung, and it's getting a little warm out there. So wherever you are, I hope you are comfy in whatever the condition is you find yourself. Um, but uh, before I get into tonight's subject, who's joining me on this adventure into uh, laws and consequences? That's what we'll call it. Sure, why not? Noah Asensio, hello. Advocatus Diaboli, hello. Short Line 819, hello. Keeverdam, hello. Seftus Wolf, hello. Miranda Stone, hello. Catherine H., hello. Mike R., hello. Uh, Tony Giff. Hello. Uh, who else is here? Jaeger Pony. Hello. Samnanyol Nation. Hello. Dr. Funkenstein's Ghost. Hello. Shell D. Hello. And of course, let me get it here because uh, come on. Come on, StreamYard. Derek LaRue, thank you. Thank you so much, as always, for your uh, continued support and generosity every time. I, I don't know what to tell you. I really appreciate it. I hope I earn your patronage, as it were. Thank you so much. And Redneck Ram. Similarly, thank you so much for the Hiya Dog Cat Fox. Oh, Dog Cat Fox. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> that was a quite a come hither uh P Dog Knight Dog Cat Fox. So thanks to P Dog Knight for that uh contribution way back in the day. Uh who else is here? Tall person, hello, no name, hello, Spooty the Rebel, hello, Tethus, Tithus, Tiethes, Tithus. Hello, Attack Alpaca, hello. Robert Pincus, hello. Angelverse, hello. Uh, Pissed Off Shitsu, hello. Corey Suzuki, hello. Fida. Oh, wait, no, F Fida. Sorry, Felda. Fida. I thought that was an I. Oh, man. This is, by the way, I, next week I'm going to get my, uh, my eyeglasses prescription updated. So that might explain part of that. So I apologize, Felda. Uh, let's see who else is here. Data Wasteland, hello. And is that everybody I saw? I hope so. I think so. Smudge. Sorry, Smudge. Almost missed you. Hello. How could I miss Smudge? And uh, with that, if uh, I missed you, if you're lurking, if you're in the future, uh, hello to you. Uh, let's see. Uh, did I say hello to Roger Reynolds? Roger Reynolds, hello. So tonight, uh, well, today actually is either it already has expired or today's the last day for Title 42. And if you have absolutely no idea what Title 42 is, well, I just did a stream on it uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, actually Monday. And um, you take a look at that. That'll tell you all about Title 42. It's a not immigration, but immigration affecting policy that with its expiration uh, is going to and is probably very, very right now causing very major problems for uh, U.S. immigration, uh, let's just say resources, capacity and so on. So uh, in that vein... As a theme night, I suppose, I looked for a uh, TEDx that had to do with immigration. And this one is from just uh, about a month ago, I think. So it's not that old. I don't know how I missed it, but, you know, my eyes aren't everywhere. And this uh, TEDx is going to pitch to us the idea of how U.S. immigration laws encourage domestic violence. Now, I tried to think ahead of time about how that could be. I tried to think ahead of time what might the argument be where you get from one to the other? I have a couple of theories. Uh, I don't want to, I mean, I'm going to hold off on them. I'm going to hold off and see what our speaker says. I don't want to make any, you know, presumptions or anything, but I'm, I'm curious to know what the argument is. And I'm not going to dismiss it out of hand because you never know. Maybe there's a point there. As with all TEDx's, I could learn something. Uh, so we'll see how this works out. Uh, tonight's bingo card is bingo card B. Uh, B as in border. Aha, now I got it. <laughs> it's in the description, links to it thereof. And also, if you direct your attention to the top of the chat box, Keeverdam has helpfully provided us the links to the fundraisers for uh, Moonshock, Angry Illinoisian, and the friend of Twisted Skipster, Tracy. I believe that's still there, isn't it? I believe so, I believe so. Uh, yes. So uh, in uh, Moonshock and Angry Illinoisian's cases, uh, they both uh, experienced some medical hardships that they are still recovering from. So if you have a couple of bucks to spare, they could certainly use it. And as for Tracy, 
Uh, she and her family are simply trying to keep the lights on and the electric bill paid. So if you have a couple of bucks for that, that is also very much welcome. If you cannot donate, that's perfectly fine. But if you can share those links out on social media, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so with all that being said, also, I have a, a, a programming note, an important programming note at the end of the show. If you're listening in the future, you can just cheat and skip to the end. But otherwise, uh, don't don't leave right away at the end. I Important thing. And if you follow me on Twitter or you're a member of the Discord, you already know what this programming note is. But for those of you that don't, you'll find out at the end of the show. All right. With all that being said as introduction, uh, this one clocks in at just over 13 minutes. Uh, it's uh, Hillary Walsh, Captives Among Us, How U.S. Immigration Law Encourages Domestic Violence. I'll start off with a few seconds for a sound test. You guys tell me if you can hear it, and then we will proceed. Meet Maria. Maria, I met a girl named Maria. All right, and, and if you know where that very, you know, badly sung lyric comes from, then you get, uh, you get a no prize. Yay. All right, uh, Miranda Stone says, good. Ebony Williams, hello. Uh, where will this go, I wonder? I don't know. We're about to find out together. And uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk, hello. And Mr. Tickle Trunk, thank you for sharing that out on social media, the link to the show. By the way, guys, I really do appreciate it if you share links to my stuff out on social media, specifically Twitter, because that's really the only social media I use in that capacity. And when you do that, I, I do appreciate it also if you could tag me in it so I know that you did, so I can thank you personally, because I appreciate it. And I, I also advise any content creator that you appreciate their work, if you do that, some way, shape, or form, they will also appreciate it as well. So just a tip. All right. So meet Maria. She's an American. Okay. She's married to her husband, Juan. Okay. Who's an undocumented immigrant. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Well, we're already... Uh... Let's see. Well, okay. Technically, it's a family anecdote, but it's not her family. Usually, we have to focus in on the speaker. Uh, so, yeah, get your bingo cards ready. We're keeping our ears open. Like all couples do from time to time, Maria and Juan squabble. Mm -hmm. But their fights, those quickly end when Maria reminds Juan that ICE is just a phone call away. Ooh. I mean, not to put a very cheap pun on it, but that's cold. <sighs> but I did put a cheap pun on it, so I really have to pay the consequence. Now, but admittedly, now that, okay, there's probably a lot to be said about uh, Juan's situation, but for Maria to have that arrow in her quiver when having fights, ouch. All right. And that after he's deported, he'll never see her or their kids again. Uh, again, there are things that could be said about Juan's choices in life, but all the same, that's, that's pretty cruel. In the past two years alone, USCIS, the government agency that grants green cards in our country, Yes. has reported that there are more than 24,000 undocumented immigrants like Juan who've reached out to our government for help because they're being abused at home by their American spouse. Okay. That's got to be an awkward situation, right? This data corresponds with my 10 years of experience as an immigration lawyer. Uh-huh. Seven out of 10 of my undocumented clients have confided in me that like Juan, they're being abused at home by their American spouse. All right. Well, all right. And I, this, is where, this is where the poverty of my information uh, comes to the fore. Uh, w depending on the state we're talking about, you can still approach law enforcement and not necessarily inherently risk being encountered with or being reported to ICE. I really guess it does depend on the state, whether it's a quote unquote sanctuary state or some other situation. Uh, but yeah, holding that over your partner's head. Yeah, that's, that's pretty harsh. Uh, here's the thing though. And this isn't in defense of anybody taking that tact against their partner. How is that effectively any different than say a spouse that knows that their partner 
committed a crime or is in the process of committing a crime, you know, or like something, and they threaten to call the cops on them. Like you, when I first learned about this, I was shocked. But as all lawyers do, I went to the statute to try to figure out how was this happening? Well, wait a second. Okay. I'm so sorry for... A, I have to continually pause because either this is a transformative work or it isn't. Secondly, thoughts keep coming to my mind. Is threatening your partner with exposure to law enforcement, does that qualify as abuse? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's a, you know, a halo around your head thing to do. But legally speaking, does that count as abuse? Now, I'm not talking morally or ethically. I'm talking just legally. Is that something that actually could be something could be done about? I don't know what 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 would the what would the person feeling under threat like that hope to gain or what could they conceivably gain from seeking help for that situation? And there it was baked into the statute, the requirement that the American file the petition for the immigrant. And that's when it all made sense. You see, if Maria doesn't file a petition for Juan, he's not getting his papers, and they both know it. Okay, well, yeah. So Juan doesn't really have many options, right, other than leaving the relationship. But then he'd be in the exact same position he would be otherwise. And Yeah, I, I guess that is a, a lousy situation to be in. If, if only Juan wasn't passively committing a federal crime, the entire time. As you can see, our immigration laws encourage this type of domestic abuse. <sighs> laws in general could be used in that way. A partner threatening to call another partner's, uh, uh, call the cops on them. If, if you know your partner is or, or has recently committed a crime that you can prove. All right, well, the problem has been stated. What is the offered solution? We still have 12 minutes to go. In mixed status families. Mixed status families. You know, this could all be solved if you didn't come into the country illegally in the first place, but what do I know? If, however, we were to change the law, yeah. we could eliminate it. Okay. What law do you want to change and how would you change it? Now, don't get me wrong. I know that when we talk about immigration reform, it seems like this daunting task. Yes. But I assure you, there is a simple solution for a pervasive problem. I seriously doubt it, but I'm willing to be convinced otherwise. Um, I'm still waiting. You know, so, so far I haven't heard anything that qualifies for... Uh, the bingo card, as far as I can tell. A solution that's Supportive of immigrants and Americans. Uh, no, supportive of illegal immigrants, because that's the only demographic that this situation you've described applies to. Stop conflating legal immigrants with illegal immigrants. These are two separate populations. A solution that's more in alignment with our American values. Okay. I call it the right to self-petition. The right to self-petition. Okay, so... I come into the country illegally, and then being in the country illegally, I petition for myself to be given a green card? Um, you know, that would kind of invalidate the whole Ill illegal entry thing, wouldn't it? Or Now, when we think about immigration reform, it feels like we got to scrap the whole thing and start all over. But what I want to talk to you about today is a very simple, small thing. It's not small and it's not simple. If, if simply by the implication of the phrase you used, and by the way, that would be attempt to coin new buzzword or buzz phrase. I'm circling that one on the board and also circling free space. Uh, yeah, it's not small. It's not simple, at least so far as you've explained it. Partially. Uh, thank you, Frosted Glass. Legal immigrants don't fear ICE. Take a guess why. Exactly. Yeah, this this program of yours, this idea of yours only applies to one particular category of immigrant. Um, 
And I, I get really irritated because I, I've, I've told this story before. I have known people in my real life who have gone through all the hoops necessary to come to and live in and or become a citizen of this country. And they went through all the bureaucracy. They made all the sacrifices. They did passed all the tests, everything. And they followed the rules and they got in and now they're citizens and it's fine. Uh, you know, every, certain circumstances are different. If you're like, you know, escaping a, a natural disaster or a war or something, that's a completely separate category of situation. But people that enter this country illegally operate on a completely different level than legal immigrants by definition. And it really irritates me. It's one of those pet peeves when people start conflating the two and together and just call immigrants in one giant category, which it, it, it's not. That's not how it works. You see, ordinarily, an undocumented person like Juan, mm -hmm. he can't petition for himself. Instead, as we see, he has to rely on an American family member to initiate the process. Uh, yes. I, this, this sounds like a non-starter from the beginning to me. But I, like I say, okay, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, thank you, Mr. Trunk. You get your green card before you enter. I think the poor deer is just confused. Oh, bless. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, too. It's like, if you're already here, what's the point of having, you know. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, yeah, you could have petitioned for a green card. You could have petitioned for a visa. Um, you know, uh, if he was going to get married to his spouse, there are procedures to go through where you can, you know, get a marriage visa or a fiance visa and then work your way through the process and follow the rules to become a citizen after marriage. There are ways to do that. Uh, there, there are mechanisms set up for those things. Um, okay, well, this situation of having your immigration status held over your head by a vindictive and or abusive spouse, I, I can't say that that isn't a problem. I don't know how big a problem is. She says 24,000 people a year or something, like, okay. And this is her solution? But Juan and Maria's real life story illustrates how our laws give all the power over the immigrant's ability to be here legally to someone else, the American. Yeah, the legal citizen of the United States. That's okay. I, I'll just end up repeating myself over and over again, which is probably likely. Now, not every mixed status marriage is abusive like Juan and Maria's. You're right. So if you put this into place, it's not going to just apply to people who are under some kind of threat. But we all know that any time in a relationship you give the power over the partner to one person, we know that there's a recipe for abuse and that things can go sideways. Okay. Well, that's not what... Okay. Uh... Mind reading assumes motives. Uh, you, you need to make, okay. You need to make the downside argument as well. Okay, you want to solve this by allowing someone who could be in an abusive situation to try to get themselves out of that situation legally without fearing authorities by allowing them to go to the authorities. All right, well, what, what's, what's, the, what's the detriment to that? What is the risk? We got to hear that too. I want to share a story with you about that. Okay. From my client Sarah's life. Mm -hmm. Sarah was a young girl in Mexico, 15 years old, and okay. she had to drop out of school because she had a baby. Ah, uh, okay. While she was working in a. Ah, uh, okay. 15. Mm, uh, mm, other things are going on there. Okay. In a resort town, she met an American man. They fell in love. Was she still 15? And he married her. Was she still 15? Said, come with me, come with your son to the United States, where we're going to build a good life together. Okay. I'll petition for you, and someday you'll even be a U.S. citizen. Okay. She got to the United States and yeah. found something different. Uh huh. She found herself cooking, cleaning, and enduring her new American husband's rapes. <sighs> uh huh. In exchange for food, shelter, 
and the promise not to call ice on her. Okay, well, then she was effectively a victim of human trafficking, and I think that puts her in a completely separate category of of situation, doesn't it? Uh, doesn't it? You see, Sarah's biggest fear was that she would get deported and be permanently separated from her son. It's her son, though. It's not his son. He met her. Okay, all right. And so Sarah stayed. Uh Uh-huh. That was 22 years ago. 22? Good gravy. And her husband still has not petitioned for her. What? Okay. And in 22 years, she never sought any kind of... So her kid is a full-grown adult at this point, and some years passed. Okay. Another example of this comes from my client, Carlos. Well, how was... <laughs> sorry. How was that resolved? Or has it been resolved? Or what, what is her out? What would... <sighs> okay. Carlos is married to Julia, uh-huh. who's an American. Okay. Together, they have three little American kids. Yeah. Julia worries constantly that Carlos is going to be deported. Well, that's the risk Carlos took when he entered the country illegally. And that's the risk they both put over their children's and their families' heads when they decided to, well, have children. uh, Okay. He's here illegally. Yes. This makes her hypervigilant controlling Uh and resentful that this is the life that she has to live. This is the life she chose. Unless he lied to her, unless he concealed this fact from her up until some point at which there was no turning back. This is the life she and he chose to live. Okay. The, the, The threat of deportation and or involvement from the federal authorities was hanging over their heads the moment they met and they knew it, and they decided to have children together under these circumstances. But if she's an American, why isn't she petitioning for his residency, green card, whatever? Is, is, this, is this another case of abuse? She monitors Carlos's cell phone location to make sure he only goes to places that she allows him to go. Okay. She doesn't let him put his name on any of the key documents, like the bank statement. Well, obviously not. I mean, (laughs) you know, in in this particular instance, this sounds like a a self-chosen problem. The bank account? Uh Uh-huh. Because he has no social security number, and he's not a citizen, and he has no papers, he's not supposed to be here. I mean, you're, you're... you're framing this as though it were some sort of abuse just seems to me to be pragmatic given the circumstances. Apartment lease. Yeah. She says this is because she wants to protect him. She doesn't want ICE to find out that he's here when in reality this is just part of the control that she has over every aspect of her husband's life. Well, if only he hadn't committed a crime. The worst, though, has to be the cash counting. You see, because Carlos, he doesn't have a work permit. So he gets jobs by standing outside Home Depot. It's day labor jobs. Yeah. And they pay in cash. Yeah. So when he gets home every night, Julia requires him to hand her the money. And in front of him, she counts it. (sighs) Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a common denominator here. If only people wouldn't cross into the country illegally. Now, in the case of the young girl and her child and being bamboozled by that guy, that's a completely separate situation. That sounds to me like a like a cut and dry case of human trafficking, effectively Uh, indentured servitude. Um, But in these other cases, it's like, well, unless there's a story otherwise, they came into the country with their eyes open across the border. And I don't know what to tell you. Hey. 
Okay, but stepping back for a second, does that then qualify as someone being... Hmm. I mean, I guess you could make the case if you had evidence of such things and it was, you know, predominant enough, you could make the case that um, you're being um, uh, unlawfully imprisoned. I'm, try I'm trying to think of a better legal term for it or something like that. But yeah, it you would have to have a really good bank of evidence. I'm not sure if that would give you a whole lot of leeway with the feds, but it might. I don't know. Let's, hmm. And if he doesn't bring home enough money that day, she doesn't let him eat. What? Jeez. Carlos loves Julia. Why? He loves his kids. Sure, but why her? He hates that this is the life that he's giving them. I, okay, okay, again, there's plenty of fault to spread around here with the original sin, but then her behavior is completely unacceptable if this story is true, and I'm just taking it on faith. But he, he, I love you for keeping me effectively imprisoned and counting calories on my earnings and everything. Really? So he hands over the cash. Yeah. And he hangs on to the hope that someday she'll make good on her promise and finally petition for him so he can get his papers. <laughs> Uh, okay. So you want to change the law for everybody, whether they're being imprisoned or have it held over them or not, so that someone comes into the country illegally, breaks federal law, cheats the system, and still gets to just petition. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they'll get it, right? Petitioning isn't a golden ticket. Am I correct? Now, the abuse of the immigration process that I'm describing here, it's not unique. The abuse of the immigration process. Sorry, who's abusing what again? It is petition. Okay. Again, don't you petition for someone before they've entered the country? Doesn't it require you to actually have entered, not enter the country? Like I, I, I have a family member on the other side of the border, right? And I'm an American citizen and I would like them to join me in America, whether it's uh, my child or my elderly grandmother or something else like that. If I petition for them to come to America, they have to be not already in the country, correct? Okay. Again, I'm not an immigration lawyer. Maybe I missed something, but this all sounds a little bit backwards to Americans, to their undocumented spouse. Sorry, let me back up a little bit. I cut her off. Now, the abuse of the immigration process that I'm describing here, it's not unique to Americans, to their undocumented spouse. It also happens from American sons and daughters to their undocumented parents. And the pain it causes reverberates throughout the family. I can imagine if only those parents hadn't come into the country illegally in the first place, but then their ratty kids are then holding that over them. Yeah. If you do that to a loved one, to a family member, that's pretty terrible. That's a terrible kind of blackmail. But it, okay. But so what your solution is just after you've already broken the law, try to petition for yourself to get what? Uh, a mulligan on the whole thing. Yeah, you'd have to report yourself to the authorities, and your 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 stay in the country is not guaranteed. So it's still a gamble, right? Take my young client's daughter, Laura. Okay. Laura's a twelve-year-old American girl coming yeah. of age. Yeah. The thing she wants to do next in life is learn how to ride her bike to school by herself. Okay. But something else preoccupies Laura. The fear that her parents or parent will be taken away from her? Laura's older brother. She's watched him, who's also an American. I, I guess that would be important to the story, wouldn't it? Throw their undocumented dad against the wall in their home and then turn to mom and say, what are you going to do? Call the police? They're just going to find two illegals here. 
Dun dun dun! Wow, this is this is just a, a cavalcade of really jerkwad people. Ah, uh, yeah, two wrongs don't make a right, but uh, holy cats! Laura has depression. Uh huh. Debilitating anxiety. Uh huh. She has a lot, lot of trouble concentrating in school when she's sitting next to your son and my daughter. Okay, so there is no avenue in any of these situations for any kind of redress, any kind of protection for domestic abuse, domestic violence, threats, blackmail, etc. Now, I, I don't, I don't know where any of these cases are taking place. Uh, so. Yeah, well, again, you've painted yourself into a corner when you come into the country illegally. I, I it's not that I don't have sympathy for someone who's being being effectively blackmailed or pushed into indentured servitude as a result of having this hanging over their head, but at the same time, uh, the answer is just what blanket golden ticket. Laura's had to learn from a young age that the people who she ought to be able to trust on the outside are not safe, and neither are the people on the inside of her home. Okay, well, her parents were reckless and negligent, and her brother is a jerkwad. Granted that this story is true, I don't know. It's hard to say, right? I mean, I, I see people in the chat saying anecdote that never really happened. I... I've known some jerkwads in families before, so I can't say that that's not true or these stories aren't aren't true. They don't sound too perfect or anything, but uh, yeah, I, I, I've seen children abuse their parents before, or not like personally, but I mean, I've seen the results of it and things like that, but, and, and likewise, you know, spouses and so on. So I can believe those stories have happened. Uh, hey, well, it's, it's a messy situation. What can I tell you? This type of instability is traumatizing. No kidding. And if only there wasn't a circumstance that some adults made for themselves, say for that pregnant girl in the earlier story, uh, that put the entire family in the situation in the first place. That doesn't invalidate, or something I should say, forgive, I should say, the behavior of either the spouses or the children that are blackmailing their own loved ones. But... The better solution is don't come into the country illegally. Our laws, our system facilitates this. If I know that my spouse is a drug dealer, I could call the cops on them at any time. If I know that my spouse is a career thief and has stolen goods in the home, I could call the cops on them at any time. I could hold over my spouse's head, my parents' head, whatever else, anything that I know about criminal activity over their head at any time. What, what exactly are you suggesting? Like I say, it, it doesn't make it right to do that. Blackmail isn't good. But... Uh, you're, the scenario you're describing can be applied to anybody, American citizen or otherwise, when you know that someone in your family is either currently or has been a part of a criminal enterprise in some way, shape, or form. Uh, okay. Now, you may wonder why. Why is it like this? And if this is the consequence of our laws, surely there must be a good reason for why is there a consequence to having consequences hanging over you for committing crimes? I, I don't know. Why? Why? Yeah, th this is the part where you're starting to lose me. Your, your solution doesn't make any sense put up against any other law or any other crime that could be committed by any adult at any particular time. I I don't know what to tell you. And it's a particularly unique situation. It's true because if you're caught, uh, you don't just go to jail necessarily. You could be kicked out of the country for, well, the rest of your life. 
uh, which is a kind of imprisonment, I suppose, away from your family and the children you had in a country where you're not meant to be here illegally in the first place. Uh, yeah. I, if you make very poor decisions for yourself, you're going to reap the consequences eventually. Or why we haven't changed them. How, what? To explain that, let me take you back to the 1800s just for a moment. Oh, God. why? What do the 1800s have to do with your proposal now? You've given us four or five different case studies on your argument. These are your examples of the situations that need to be redressed by your idea. Okay, now you need to describe how this would work the pluses and the minuses, the obstacles to overcome. Why are we now going back in time? This was the time when our immigration laws were designed, but still followed today. Uh, our immigration laws of the 1800s are the ones we still follow today. Okay, first off, I'm circling weightless example. Because uh, no, no. Uh, there, there might be bits and pieces of language or or sentiment but no come on and the social norm at the time was that women were regarded as the property of their husband and you've just described at least one scenario where the husband was the property of the wife so meh. and so it makes sense when we look at our structure for immigration laws today that of course the american husband would petition for his foreign wife and today, that's continued. The American petitions for the immigrant. You just gave us a story where the wife was basically enslaving the husband. What are you talking about? What? I'm glad I circled weightless example because that's just... No. But the thing that's also continued is that the immigrant is still essentially treated like the property of the American family member. Well, only if they're a jerkwad. But yeah, the person here illegally is under a heck of a lot more risk than the person who's not here illegally, if you can believe it. I, I mean, it sounds like she's basically saying we should just throw out the idea of illegal immigration. If you show up, you're fine. Any way you can get across the border, you're fine. This idea would cause more people to rush the border and to take risks with their lives and the lives of their children just to get here. Because as long as you can get across that line and I don't have to have somebody petition for me, I don't have to go through any bureaucracy, I don't have to go through any approval process. Is she, is she going to acknowledge the inherent pitfalls of this idea, I wonder? Folks, there's no good reason for continuing this process. Yes, there is. Have you seen the numbers of people who have died coming to this country? Have you seen the numbers of human trafficking as a result of people coming to this country illegally? But do you have any idea? Are you willing to at least admit the possible downfalls of this concept of yours? Because you're not just making a rule for people who are being abused by their American spouses, okay? If you can self-petition, then you don't have to have any connections to this country beforehand. You just have to show up and petition. And that's it. You, you might as well not even have immigration laws anymore. As long as you can cross that line. It is going to be the worst marathon race you've ever seen if you implemented this. Cross that line. Climb that wall, get smuggled in, pay somebody money, risk your life, cross the Rio Grande, risk drowning. As long as you can get across that line, you don't have to go through any border checks, you don't have to go through any paperwork, nothing. As long as you can get into the country and petition for yourself, and that's all you have to do. Are you nuts? I mean, these stories she's giving us sound like absolute horror stories. I'm not going to deny that. But there's a bigger picture here to what she's proposing. It, okay. Let me tell you a couple reasons why. Okay, tell me why. First of all, if we were to allow, if we change things, and we were to allow for immigrants to petition for themselves. Illegal immigrants. We're not going to see 
an increase in fraudulent marriages. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, that's not my first concern, honestly, but really? Come on. Come on. Really? What? What is that? What the fuck is that? Oh! Okay, what you're proposing goes far beyond concerns about marriage. You're taking the petitioner out of the equation. You're taking the citizen petitioner entirely out of the equation. Self-petitioning requires no other individual. But your first thing is, oh, first assurance, is, oh, it's not going to increase fraudulent marriages. Oh, well, I mean, of course not. Why? Why? <sighs> All right. Do you have any other assurances for me? You're going you're gonna to say it's not going to increase people making a run for the border? Uh, thank you, Kiefer Dam. A couple of reasons. A list. Ah, oh, you're right. Kiefer Dam is correct. That would constitute a list. A couple of reasons. Circling a list on the board as well. Come on now. USCIS already has a system for independently verifying the authenticity of marriages totally separate from the Americans' involvement. Okay, so if it's literally a non-issue, then why did you bring it up? We're also not going to see an increase of people being a burden on society. I would like you to go take a tour of El Paso right now. See what happens when a whole bunch of people who have come to this country with nothing still need to be taken care of as a matter of just basic humanitarian needs. Go look at El Paso. Immigrants petitioning for themselves will help reduce that, in fact, because our existing system forces more people below the poverty line and in need of social services. You mean living in the country illegally makes it hard for people to get legitimate work? Well, I really want her to at least attempt to address the obvious problem with an automatic increase of people running for the border illegally. If you do not need to apply for papers, if you can apply after you've already gotten here, if you can be given the right to self-petition once you're in the country, is she going to address the obvious elephant in the room? People like Sarah. Okay. Sarah, was that the girl that came across? Okay, if that's the girl that got pregnant and everything, okay, that is that sounds like a completely separate criminal enterprise going on there. That guy is effectively got an indentured servant, and it sounds more like he's guilty of human trafficking. Okay. 22 years on. Who don't have a social security number, and they can't get a driver's license. And so when they do drive, they're driving without car insurance. Uh-huh. It's almost like you're continually risking breaking the law by breaking the law. Uh, thank you, Matt Barnes. There's nothing to see in El Paso, scribe. Ask the border chief, Kamala Harris. Hey, come, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, that was that was a whole other conversation I had uh, on the Discord before the show. Hey, uh, yeah, but that's 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 a talk for another time. Well, actually, I've, I've done a couple of streams on such things before, but yeah, uh, it's yeah. Once Title Forty Two expires, man. Ugh. The millions of people like Carlos, who are the breadwinners of their family, but because they don't have work authorization, they have to work twice as hard for half the pay. Address the risk of the increase of people coming to the country illegally if your proposal were actually real. You say you're an immigration lawyer. Okay. You've obviously thought about this a lot. There, there are not only upsides to your idea. Come on. And you know who pays the ultimate price for all of this? The American taxpayer? If we don't change things? It's if, if you're going to say the children, I, I don't have that Simpson stinger here, but if you're going to say the children. It's not the taxpayer. It's not the taxpayer? Oh, okay. Well, heck, I... <laughs> I I stay I must be wearing, you know, uh orthopedic shoes because I stand corrected. 
It's not the church. It's not schools. Oh. In fact, it's not our government. Mm. The person who pays the price for this yeah. is the millions and millions and millions of American children of undocumented immigrants. I knew it! Could I call it? Jeez! <laughs> Won't somebody please think of the children? Oh, man, come on. That is such a cheap shot. That is such a cheap shot. Oh, come on, lady. <sighs> They're who pay the price for this. Yeah, oftentimes if you have children who are born in America or who are brought over the border illegally by their parents who are coming here illegally, yes, they are going to bear a burden that their parents probably don't have to. And their parents are the ones putting them in that situation. Okay, I said it before. I've said it any dozens of times on my previous uh, Expatriate Games videos. Every time I hear a story of someone being deported and they show pictures of their crying children, I just think to myself, I really wish their parent had not put their children in that position in the first place. It, it, it's no different than having your parent be found out to be a drug dealer or a thief or having committed some other crime that's going to end up separating them from their families by them going to prison or what have you. The mechanisms are exactly the same. If you commit a crime and you try to avoid law enforcement from catching you for committing that crime, you're putting yourself and anyone around you at a risk of disruption and heartache as a result. B being here illegally doesn't put you in some kind of special status for the consequences you're going to face for making that decision. They are putting their children at risk. They are. Ugh. Matt Barnes, thank you so much. Always remember you can be whatever with a degree. Doesn't mean you finish top of your class. She has a lovely ornate straw man she's creating. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've i learned I can be whatever with a degree. I got an English degree. I have, I've, I don't, I've never had a job that was requiring of me an English degree. I've actually ended up in like information technology just by dumb luck, I suppose. But uh yeah, no, there's there's no there's no panacea for your situation. Either you can make it or you can't, and there you go. But anyway, I just <sighs> this is frustrating to hear because, like I say, these individual stories she's giving us, if they are true, and again, I don't have any reason to think that they're not inherently, and nothing sounds too far afield of the worst of human nature. Uh, yeah, I, I I hope that she's doing something to help her clients to alleviate that situation that they find themselves in one way or the other. Uh, because like I say, it's one thing to have made the decision to come into the country illegally. If you're being abused, uh, blackmailed or otherwise by someone in your own family, that doesn't make that right or justified. I don't know exactly how you navigate that situation or resolve it. That's gotta be complicated, but her proposed solution is not the way as the anti Mandalorian would say. Laura, hey. The price for this. Laura pays the price for this. Uh huh. I don't know about you guys, but I think it's time for a change. Yeah, I think that her brother needs to grow up. Laura pays the price for her brother's actions. Laura pays the price for her parents' actions. Laura's caught in the middle of two parents who came into the country illegally and then put their children into an untenable situation. And her brother's taking advantage of that because he's a jerkwad. Uh, is her brother not paying the price for this? I mean, he's a child as well, right? Uh, okay, long silences help me in no way, shape, or form. And it's up to us, the to American what? voter, because we hold the key to change. Y yes, I suppose we do. What is the likelihood, given the movement or lack thereof on immigration reform that has not taken place over, say, just, I don't know, the last 15, 20 years, what is the likelihood that anyone in the government is going to look at your proposal and say, that's a great idea? 
if you're not even willing to admit the possible pitfalls of it. Laura can't change anything. Laura's older brother is making sure that mom and dad can't change anything. Well, isn't he a child? Isn't he an American child of illegal immigrants? Isn't he paying the price? But me and you, we can. We can take a stand against domestic abuse in our... <sighs> Taking a stand against domestic abuse is one thing. Writing an open ticket to anybody who crosses the border into having a shot at a, at a free ride, that, that doesn't help anything. That will not help anything. Our loss. Let me uh, back up a little bit. I cut her off. Me and you, we can. We can take a stand against domestic abuse in our loss. Whether it's in an immigrant's home or whether it's in an American's home or whether it's in a mixed status home, we can take a stand against all domestic abuse. And when it's codified in our statutes, we can change that. Okay, tell you what, I hate to tell you this, domestic abuse is already illegal. It's been codified in our laws, state by state. Provable domestic violence, domestic abuse is a crime. All right. Now, I have a hard time believing that there is absolutely no pathway for protection or redress in all of the cases that you cited. That if I'm being held as an effective slave in my own household and having my immigration situation held over me, that there's no shelter, there's no avenue for protection. Same thing with the husband. Not the wife, mind you, in your own story about the 1800s or whatever, that the husband being turned into an indentured servant doesn't have some kind of redress he can't seek out in some way, shape, or form. Okay, but if you want to say, oh, we have to take a stand against domestic abuse, well, that's a completely separate kettle of fish than what you're talking about. You're talking about fundamentally opening up the border, or at least, at the very least, telling everybody the border now is the finish line. If you get across that line, you're good to go. You don't need to apply for anything. You can petition for yourself and somehow, some way, we'll house you here while you petition for your status or something. Come on. So the first thing you have to do mm -hmm. if you want to get on board with this yes. is make that decision. Oh, that make a decision? Oh, okay. So I'm going to be I'm going to be responsible for choosing to or not to do something. Okay. I stand against domestic abuse in the United States. That it. Come on, lady. That that is such a switcheroo. And the next thing you do is you shop wisely. What? Because when you go to the ballot box, what? shop. You're looking for a governor a senator or two, and a president who's committed to making simple changes. That is not a... S Nothing of what you're proposing is a simple change. Nothing of what you're proposing will cure domestic abuse. Nothing. If there is an abusive member of the household... Okay. Let's think about this for a second. If you have someone in the scenarios that you presented who has a mindset, an attitude, a mentality willing to hold over their loved one's head, their immigration status to make them do things or to be subservient, what do you think them being a legal immigrant would suddenly change that dynamic? They wouldn't find other ways to try to control this person, abuse them, take advantage of them, threaten them. But even setting that aside, again, this is not a small, simple change you're proposing. And, and it's actually kind of interesting that you spent more time giving us scenarios and stories and waxing philosophical about the idea of it than actually telling us about the nuts and bolts of how it would work, how it would be implemented. And again, not admitting to the obvious downsides. We don't have to scrap the whole thing to make a simple change. Uh, you might as well scrap the whole thing if you make this quote-unquote simple change because then our immigration laws will effectively be nullified. Being in the country illegally will have no more meaning. 
like the right to self-petition. The right. Guys, if we do this. Mm-hmm. Yes. What happens if we do this? We do this. Yes. Imagine the ripple that we can make. <laughs> I am I am already imagining and I've already articulated the kinds of ripples that this will cause. Mostly of bodies floating in the Rio Grande. Okay, I, I admit that's a bit hyperbolic. That's a bit out there. But don't tell me that such an idea would not cause more people to risk their lives than are already doing so. Holy cats. Imagine what it's going to be like for Laura to ride her bike home from school all by herself one day. What has that got to do with her having a jerkwad brother? And for her to open the door to her home. And because of you, there's no more nuclear option of her American family member threatening to call ICE. Her American, you mean her brother? One of the other children of illegal immigrants that you said were the people paying the price? Again, if her brother is of such a low character that he's willing to hold that over his parents' head, you think he's going to suddenly, what, become a better person in the household as a result of that change? What? On her parents. Ugh. I believe that our children deserve that kind of security. Oh, come. Stop tugging the children heartstrings. It is so cheap. It is so cheap. I believe that the United States of America promises it. Wait, we, we promise what? Hold on. What? Promise. Our children deserve that kind of security. I believe that the United States of America promises it. No, the United States of America does not promise the protection of children from being separated from parents who have committed crimes. No, it just it doesn't apply. That makes absolutely no sense at all. And it's up to us to provide it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. That's it. It's over. We rewound here to the start. Anyway, uh, there is the presentation. Uh, uh, setting everything else aside and just, you know, not a compelling case. Not a compelling argument. Uh, leaning so much on heartstrings and children and everything else without even describing what your plan is, how it would work, not even admitting to the possible pitfalls. Oh, there won't be there won't be an influx of of uh, fraudulent marriages, guys. There really won't. That that's that's not anyone who's thinking for three seconds is first concern. Just sell the right to self petition. And every scenario she was talking about was someone who was already in the country illegally, not somebody who just like comes up to the border and wants to petition by themselves and then has to wait to be processed. Now you're already here. Okay. Anyway, uh, see here, here's, here's the problem with talking about these subjects. You know, anything that criticizes someone that's coming up and talking about stories of obvious hardship and obvious abuse, anything that you say in either opposition criticism or questioning about it makes it come across like, Oh, I'm a jerkwad. I'm inhuman. I'm insensitive and so on. In situations like this, when you're talking about a massive shift in immigration policy, you have to lean more on pragmatism than on the heartstrings. You have to look at the cold equations of it. Unfortunately, that's just the way it works. You know, four or five examples of terrible people doing terrible things to people who are in a vulnerable situation it is not an argument for making a change like that. It just, it just isn't. And uh, while those situations might be true and those stories of blackmail might be absolutely uh, correct, that doesn't justify what she's talking about. If she had an argument for some other kind of pathway to shelter or help for people in such a situation, I, I might be on board with that, but that's not what she's talking about. She's talking about a fundamental shift in how we deal with immigration in this country. 
not something that focuses specifically on people in abusive situations. And then to somehow say that standing up for her change fights domestic abuse as though any civilized or rational person isn't already against domestic abuse and we don't already have laws against domestic abuse. I don't know. Anyway, I could go on, but let's go to the bingo card. All right, I'm going to go over this one more time by myself. Uh, if you have arguments for squares to be circled, please hold on to them and I will get to you presently. Anecdote that probably never happened. I know a lot of you are going to be angry with me over this one, but honestly, there was nothing in the stories that she told me that sounded so far afield from possible reality, given how humans work one to another at times, that they sounded false on their face. I, I, I don't have any reason to believe that any of those were ginned up or anything. Now, her leveraging elements of those stories for her argument that's a different story. That's a different story in and of itself. But the actual anecdotes, I could believe them. Uh, I, I'm happy to hear your arguments in the counter. That's fine. But it's it, it it's an uphill climb for me to circle that one. Uh, self vilification or wretchedness. She never really talked about herself in any way, shape, or form, up up down or otherwise. Systemic institutional. Yeah, immigration system. Uh, the. 1800s institution of these laws and somehow it's in inher inherently well, I'll get to patriarchy in a minute word salad no I, I understood what she was saying nothing was you know just yeah just random words coming out and I eh, nothing sound like words out leaves out vital context yeah uh, even a smidge of acknowledging the possible downsides of her argument of her proposal not not even the barest hint uh, in, 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 in the omission of anything that could be a flawed element of her plan, yeah, collectivize his own demographic. Um, I mean, technically as Americans, etc. So Americans being more or less that, uh, white supremacy. She never really brought up race. Truth be told, she never brought up race privilege. Uh, well, it's heavily, uh, words never said, but obviously those who have the power, right, between uh, who's a citizen and who's not, who can petition and who can't, uh, that is, and also when we're talking about, you know, the, the freedom of movement and ability to get a bank account and a job and so on, yeah, those are privileges that are afforded to citizens, not elsewise. Sales pitch for product or service. Uh, no, she never brought up uh, her own law. I mean, she said she's an immigration lawyer, but... She never like advertised her law firm or gave us a book or anything like that. So, or, or, or even, or even mentioned organization or anything. Plays victim. I mean, it's usually applied to the speaker themselves. Do they make themselves out to be a victim? Um, and it, but here's the thing. If I'm willing to accept that the anecdotes and the stories that she gave us are conceivably true, then nothing about them was play acting. People in those situations were obviously victims. Even if they broke the law in coming to the country illegally, then their their loved one holding it over them, yeah, that's not playing a victim. So I leave that there. Uh, let's see, wage gap. Um, yeah, she did talk about uh, the ability to make money and earn a living and et cetera. So kind of wage gap between those who are here legally and those who aren't uh patriarchy yes in talking about how men were controlling of the women and so on uh now i can imagine some wiseacre out there might say well feminism feminism's in there as well because there was the story of the wife holding it over the husband i i i know i'm no <laughs> No, but feminism as a, as a reversal, no, that, never, that was never really brought up as far as I can tell. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I know that literally speaking, she was arguing for inclusion of people into the country who aren't here to petition for themselves and everything. That's not quite what the square represents, so I need, uh, I need a much better argument for that. Marginalized marginalization. Uh, yes, that's inherent to people uh, who are um, 
hiding from law enforcement and they live on the fringe of society effectively because they can't get a license, get a job, etc. So in the literal sense, even though it wasn't uh, stated, argumentative non sequitur. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the 1800s thing. And specifically talking about how it was the man who has control over the woman after she'd already told us a story about a woman holding it over a man. And then, you know, likewise with the son holding it over both of his parents. That, 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 that had nothing to do with anything and didn't contribute at all to the argument. Uh, childhood or family anecdote. I'm going to be a little strict on this one. It has to be the speaker bringing it up about their own childhood or family. It, re it really is. That's classically how it is. Just talking about something else, I, I don't think applies. Contradicts own point or argument. Uh, contradicts. Well, I mean, the whole thing was contradictory because she was talking about a change to immigration law, but then she tried to play it up and sell it as though it were a fight against domestic violence. And that going along with her idea is a declaration of being against domestic violence. When these two things are not inherently connected one to another, she tried to make that argument. It didn't work as far as I'm concerned and trying to draw it to, I mean, it just felt like more leveraging the heartstrings more than anything else without considering the obvious uh, problems with her idea. So uh, yeah, it was contradictory in that she didn't really give much of an argument and the argument that she made didn't really apply as far as I can tell, uh, benevolent condescension. Yeah. If you, if you're, if you want to make a stand against domestic violence, like, come on. Like, uh, yeah, if I, if you don't agree with me, obviously you're what for domestic violence. What? Anyway. And lastly, microaggressions, unconscious bias. Um, there wasn't really anything unconscious here. This was people taking conscious actions to take advantage of people in a decidedly vulnerable situation. Uh, and microaggressions. Yeah, I didn't really get anything like that in here either. Boy, oh boy. It's just the luck of the draw with this card so far, right? So many squares, but no bingos. Just like missing it here, there, and otherwise. All right, guys, I'm going to open it up to you. If you have arguments for squares to be circled, please put them in the chat now. If I've already missed your comment and I don't get to it, please repost it. Uh, Q continuum anecdote. There were no sources for the stories told. There never are. Never. It's 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 an estimation of the anecdote itself, uh, the details given, the effect it's meant to have, and so on. Uh, again, her use of those examples in pulling on heartstrings. I don't. I got a problem with that as far as her argument is concerned. As far as the anecdotes themselves, none of them sounded incredible, and I don't mean incredible in the positive sense. Like they 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 had a a level of credibility just by you know, things that can happen in life. So, uh, and, and again, I'm open to having someone give me specific examples or make an argument for a specific anecdote. But in the overall, I didn't hear anything that sounded, for lack of a better phrase, too good to be true for the sake of her argument. Uh, Super Koopa TV, the word illegal is meaningless to these people, to them, and there's no such thing. I, I again, I, this is one of those situations where I would love to have seen if there was one, some kind of Q&A session with the speaker afterwards, because there is an obvious question right hanging in the air over her proposal that I would love to ask. Like, how would this not encourage a race to the border and people risking their lives, their safety and onward? Because if all they have to do is get in to petition for themselves, then what's going to stop uh, an influx of people and I mean, criminal elements or otherwise just getting here and putting themselves in the same physical risks as they are right now trying to get to the border without such an idea. That, that's just, I mean, admittedly, that's just one potential downfall of the thing, but I think it's a pretty major one. Uh, let's see. Okay, Q continuum. Uh, contradicts. Oh, I already circled contradicts. Uh, more explanation of earlier posts. The examples of domestic abuse involve a citizen and an illegal immigrant. So changing the immigration laws would not solve domestic violence. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Anyone who has the mentality to do that to their loved one or their family member. Uh, yeah. You, you take away one piece of leverage against them. Trust me, they'll, they'll find another one. If they already have that, that sensibility and how they want to treat someone in their family, 
Yeah, they, that is one tool they can use, but it, it wouldn't be the only one. Uh, let's see. Uh, Darren Root, whom does the wife controlling the husband count for feminism? I, I, I already said no. I already, I, I preempted you if that's what you meant. Uh, did she forget about client lawyer privilege? She didn't give any names. And I'm sure the names were probably pseudonyms or something. Uh, again, real life examples. So anyway, uh, da, 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 da. let's see. Advocacy, I believe, scribe light, not a bingo square, but she said, quote, I am against domestic abuse in the U.S., unquote. So I can only assume she is cool with it everywhere. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Admission by omission. Is that what you're trying to push there? I, I suppose. I suppose it's possible. Uh, Seftis Wolf, white supremacy, the white people trying to keep the brown people in slavery. Uh, that, that really wasn't a major theme within this. So I'm going to say no. Uh, Johnny Hellcat, patriarchy. I'm not sure. I showed up late to the party and not actually sure why. Oh, well, patriarchy because she took us back to the 1800s and tried to tie some line between men's ownership over women now equating to an American citizen's ability to petition for someone who's not an American. As though those things had anything to do with each other in any kind of sensical way. That's what that was. Uh, let's see. Uh, Genty Maxi, vote blue because think of the children. Something like that. Something like that. Uh, and, and did I call it, man? I knew it. Who's going to pay for this? Not the taxpayer. Oh, oh okay. But the children. Oh, the children. Uh, let's see. Any other arguments for squares to be circled? I mean, it, it. it's completely legitimate that we get no bingos out of this because she was very focused. She leaned on anecdotes more than a whole lot of other argumentation over the course of the thing. Um, and I mean, I, I keep looking at word salad. Like, I mean, I understood what she was saying. She, she wasn't just like belting out phrases for the sake of belting out phrases. Um, her, her, her argument was not very effective. Obviously her examples, um, again, I could see this being a much stronger case for some kind of pathway to protection for people in that situation. And especially the lady who was, uh, you know, had the kid and she's brought over and then she becomes effectively a, an indentured servant slash slave in the household. That, that alone sounds like that lady, given her circumstances, might be given a bit of a pass and a bit of leniency in her situation since she is effectively smuggled into the country and, and trafficked. Uh, and having, having her child held over her like that and separation, that's a whole other that's a whole other ball game as far as I'm concerned. The other ones are a bit murkier. The other examples she gave are a bit murkier with, you know, one spouse holding it over another spouse. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. There's this, this presentation could have been an argument for a different idea. Let me put it that way. There's probably a better idea hidden somewhere within this situation that could have been proposed than the one that she was proposing because the, 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 the lines did not line up. They just didn't, the, the streams did not cross on this one. If that makes any sense. Uh, let's see. Q continuum. Scribe needs to shuffle the card. Might have more opportunities for bingo. Well, this is, this is the uh, mechanism of choosing the bingo card. Cause there's three bingo cards, a, B and C and the results of the poll from earlier today on Twitter resulted in B. Now, if we'd had bingo card a or bingo card C, these same uh, squares being circled might have led to several bingos. So we have a shuffle. It's a bit static of a shuffle, but it's all up to the random chance from the both the talk uh, and the uh, poll on Twitter. The poll, which you can take part in uh, every Thursday, I try to post that in the morning so that you can have the opportunity to participate in the poll on Twitter. You just have to follow me there at scribe underscore light. Okay, programming note. I promised a programming note before I get into the closure of the show. Here we go. Sunday, May 21st at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. And then because of the way time zones work across the globe, Monday, May 22nd at 10 a.m. That's not me saying there's two shows. I'm saying this is all happening at the same time because the time in Sydney, Australia is far ahead 
of where I am. And so, but either way, the fourth episode of Living on Borrowed Crime will be occurring Sunday, the 21st, 5 p.m. Pacific. And then you make the adjustments for your time zone. And scheduled to appear, Matt Orchard and Dave's Lemonade. I am looking for slash hoping I can bring on a third guest, but I don't want to write any checks I can't cash quite yet. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's coming up. If you're already following me on Twitter or if you're already a member of the Discord server, you might already know this. If you're not a member of the Discord server, why, I'm going to put a link into the chat in just a second here that will give you access to the Discord server. And all you have to do upon landing into the Discord server, link is in the chat now, all you have to do is say the secret word. The secret word for today is, uh, what's a good secret word for today? Um, I don't know what applies to this one. Let me think for a second. Hmm. Uh, oh, petition. There you go. Petition. That works. The secret word for today is petition. So if you land into the Discord server and just say petition, I and my moderators will know you reach the end of the show and watch the show and are a, a viewer and you can join the Discord server. And also, before it passes me by completely, Miranda Stone, thank you so much, Miranda, for your generosity, as always. Everybody be sure to thank Miranda, thank Keeverdam, uh, the two den mothers of the chat uh, and moderators over on the Discord server for all that they do to help support the chat and uh, and promote it. I appreciate it. And everything that they do to help out. And everybody else who's got a wrench. Because uh, moderators, thank you for keeping an eye on things. Even though everyone here is so well-behaved, you have very little to do. Everybody who donated, thank you, thank you so much. Either to myself or any of the fundraisers at the top of the chat box, thank you so much for your generosity. I really do appreciate it. Uh, also, the Sunday stream. There will be a Sunday stream on Sunday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, where I'll talk about a thing. It might be immigration again. Not sure yet. I have to wait and see what the news uh, has, but I'll decide that on Saturday because I never decide these things until the last minute because, hey, I like to live recklessly. Well, actually, I don't, but, you know, that's that's the kind of thing that you say. Either way, everybody. Oh, wait. Wait, what's this? What's this? Ebony Williams. Kind of a stretch, but diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diverse circumstances with the families. I mean, she said mixed status families. It wasn't really promoting. Yeah, I, I, I don't, don't think that quite applies. I can, I can see where you're coming from, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I'll be a little strict on that one because it would be a bingo square. But uh, all right, well, that aside, Ebony, thank you for the suggestion either way. Everyone else, I hope you enjoyed the stream. On your way out, if you could hit the like button, I'd appreciate it. Or the dislike button if you didn't. I appreciate the engagement either way. Leave a comment if you would, if you can, if you want to. And with that, everybody, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you all have a good rest of your Thursday. I hope you have a good Friday ahead of you and weekend as well. I hope you are all safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.